Chapter 4. Plants and Primates. Postcards from the Stoned Age. Ify had more summers than all the fingers of his two hands. He was near now to the age when he would join the hunters at their fire. It was a great step, this short journey from the children's hut to the fire of the hunters near the song hut of the true men. It had been a long journey not through space but through time. For many years he had been pointed toward this day, the hours of practicing spear thrusts with the fire-hardened sticks that served the boys for mock weapons, Doknu's endless instruction in tracking, in reading weather signs, in remaining aware of the winds, and instruction in the magic of hunting. The boy suppressed a desire to finger the talisman that his mother had prepared for him and that now hung from his neck. He did not move. His mind seemed removed from the scene, as if viewing it from above and a little way off. He had stood thus for more than twelve hours, unmoving, all but unwinking. This will give you the gift of stillness and power. He remembered the soapy taste of the rasped root bark as he had forced it down under the watchful gaze of his teacher, Doknu. With this you become invisible, little brother, he had said, adding in a calm voice, Kill cleanly, then you honor our ancestors. If he could feel that the moment of his truth was now nearly upon him. Under the influence of the Togna, the plant of power to sit still, he had been brought to this desolate place and told to wait near the fresh carcass of a zebra. Doknu, his father, and his uncles had all wished him well, laughing, making promises, and using new and unfamiliar words to describe the way the village women would receive him if he succeeded. Those words had excited him for a time, but then he had settled into his weight. The Togna made this a wonderfully easy thing for the boy to do. His body seemed impervious to fatigue, and his mind drifted, delighted with scenes swimming in his head from stories and experiences told around the fire. Suddenly and without his shifting a hair, Ify's mind flared into total alertness. Something sounded nearby. There it was again. From the pebble-strewn wash beyond the tamarisks under which he waited came a dry sound. Chuff, chuff. If he felt neither fear nor dread of what he was about to see, he anticipated, his muscles drew power into themselves from the shimmering air. He did not move. The lioness was enormous, and wary with the stealth of all animals in the land of the great hunters. Thinking that he was but a boulder or a tree, if he watched, the lioness was no more than twice his body length away. Dropping her guard, she moved forward to nuzzle the zebra's bloodied haunch. At that moment, from a center of focus hundreds of generations deep, if he struck, cleanly, slightly to one side of the spine and behind the shoulder blade. The scream of mingled pain and rage was ear-splitting. So great was the force behind the man-boy's blow that for a moment the lioness was pinned to the ground, long enough for the boy to leap away from the claws of the dying animal. The bellies of Ify's clan would be filled that night, and the hunter's circle would admit a new member to their boisterous and privileged ranks. This example makes clear the way in which a beneficial plant, in this case a powerful stimulant, once discovered can be included in the diet and thus confer an adaptive advantage. A plant can confer strength and alertness and so ensure hunting success and steady food supplies. The person or group is much less threatened by certain environmental factors, which may have previously limited individuals' lifespans and hence the growth of the population as a whole. Less easy to understand is the way in which plant hallucinogens might have provided similar yet different adaptive advantages. These compounds do not, for example, catalyze the immune system into higher states of activity, although this may be a secondary effect. Rather, they catalyze consciousness, that peculiar self-reflecting ability that has reached its greatest apparent expression in human beings. They do not, however, cause consciousness, which is a generalized function present in some degree in all life forms. Catalysis is a speeding up of processes that are already present. One can hardly doubt that consciousness, like the ability to resist disease, confers an immense adaptive advantage on any individual who possesses it. In the search for a causal agent capable of synergizing cognitive activity, and thereby of playing a role in the emergence of the hominid, Researchers might long ago have looked to plant hallucinogens, were it not for our strong, almost compulsive avoidance of the idea that our exalted position in the hierarchy of nature might be somehow due to the power of plants or natural forces of any sort. Even as the 19th century had to come to terms with the notion of human descent from apes, 
We must now come to terms with the fact that those apes were stoned apes. Being stoned seems to have been our unique characteristic. Human Uniqueness To seek to understand human beings is to seek to understand their uniqueness. The radical division between human beings and the rest of nature is so striking that, for pre-scientific thinkers, it was sufficient proof that we were the divinely favored portion of creation, somehow different, somehow nearer to God. After all, human beings speak, fantasize, laugh, fall in love, are capable of great acts of self-sacrifice or of cruelty. Human beings create great works of art and propound theoretical and mathematical models of phenomena. And human beings distinguish themselves by the sheer numbers of kinds of substances they use and become addicted to in the environment. Human Cognition all the unique characteristics and preoccupations of human beings can be summed up under the heading of cognitive activities. Dance, philosophy, painting, poetry, sport, meditation, erotic fantasy, politics, and ecstatic self-intoxication. We are truly Homo sapiens, the thinking animal. Our acts are all a product of the dimension that is uniquely ours, the dimension of cognitive activity, of thought and emotion, memory and anticipation, of psyche. From observing the ayahuasca-using people of the Upper Amazon, it became very clear to me that shamanism is often intuitively guided group decision-making. The shamans decide when the group should move or hunt or make war. Human cognition is an adaptive response that is profoundly flexible in the way it allows us to manage what in other species are genetically programmed behaviors. We alone live in an environment that is conditioned not only by the biological and physical constraints to which all species are subject, but also by symbols and language. Our human environment is conditioned by meaning, and meaning lies in the collective mind of the group. Symbols and language allow us to act in a dimension that is supranatural, outside the ordinary activities of other forms of organic life. We can actualize our cultural assumptions, alter and shape the natural world in the pursuit of ideological ends and according to the internal model of the world that our symbols have empowered us to create. We do this through the elaboration of ever more effective, and hence ever more destructive, artifacts and technologies which we feel compelled to use. Symbols allow us to store information outside of the physical brain. This creates for us a relationship to the past very different from that of our animal companions. Finally, we must add to any analysis of the human picture the notion of self-directed modification of activity. We are able to modify our behavior patterns based on a symbolic analysis of past events, in other words, through history. Through our ability to store and recover information as images and written records, we have created a human environment as much conditioned by symbols and languages as by biological and environmental factors. The Transformations of Monkeys The evolutionary breakouts that led to the appearance of language and later writing are examples of fundamental, almost ontological transformations of the hominid line. Besides providing us with the ability to code data outside the confines of DNA, cognitive activities allow us to transmit information across space and time. At first this amounted merely to the ability to shout a warning or a command, really little more than a modification of the cry of alarm that is a familiar feature of the behavior of social animals. Over the course of human history this impulse to communicate has motivated the elaboration of ever more effective communication techniques. But by our century, this basic ability has turned into the all-pervasive communications media, which literally engulf the space surrounding our planet. The planet swims through a self-generated ocean of messages. Telephone calls, data exchanges, and electronically transmitted entertainment create an invisible world experienced as global informational simultaneity. We think nothing of this. As a culture, we take it for granted. Our unique and feverish love of word and symbol has given us a collective gnosis, a collective understanding of ourselves and our world that has survived throughout history until very recent times. This collective gnosis lies behind the faith of earlier centuries in universal truths and common human values. Ideologies can be thought of as meaning-defined environments. They are invisible, yet they surround us and determine for us, though we may never realize it, what we should think about ourselves in reality. Indeed, they define for us what we can think. 
The rise of globally simultaneous electronic culture has vastly accelerated the rate at which we can each obtain information necessary to our survival. This and the sheer size of the human population as a whole have brought to a halt our physical evolution as a species. The larger a population is, the less impact mutations will have on the evolution of that species. This fact, coupled with the development of shamanism and later scientific medicine, has removed us from the theater of natural selection. Meanwhile, libraries and electronic databases have replaced the individual human mind as the basic hardware providing storage for the cultural database. Symbols and languages have gradually moved us away from the style of social organization that characterized the mute nomadism of our remote ancestors and has replaced that archaic model with a vastly more complicated social organization characteristic of an electronically unified planetary society. As a result of these changes, we ourselves have become largely epigenetic, meaning that much of what we are as human beings is no longer in our genes, but in our culture. The Prehistoric Emergence of Human Imagination Our capacity for cognitive and linguistic activity is related to the size and organization of the human brain. Neural structures concerned with conceptualization, visualization, signification, and association are highly developed in our species. Through the act of speaking vividly, we enter into a flirtation with the domain of the imagination. The ability to associate sounds or the small mouth noises of language with meaningful internal images is a synesthetic activity. The most recently evolved areas of the human brain, Broca's area and the neocortex, are devoted to the control of symbol and language processing. The conclusion universally drawn from these facts is that the highly organized neurolinguistic areas of our brain have made language and culture possible. Where the search for scenarios of human emergence and social organization is concerned, the problem is this. We know that our linguistic abilities must have evolved in response to enormous evolutionary pressures, but we do not know what these pressures were. Where psychoactive plant use was present, hominid nervous systems over many millennia would have been flooded with hallucinogenic realms of strange and alien beauty. However, evolutionary necessity channels the organism's awareness into a narrow cul-de-sac, where ordinary reality is perceived through the reducing valve of the senses. Otherwise, we would be rather poorly adapted for the rough and tumble of immediate existence, as creatures with animal bodies, we are aware that we are subject to a range of immediate concerns that we can ignore only at great peril. As human beings, we are also aware of an interior world, beyond the needs of the animal body, but evolutionary necessity has placed that world far from ordinary consciousness. Patterns and Understanding Consciousness has been called awareness of awareness and is characterized by novel associations and connections among the various data of experience. Consciousness is like a super non-specific immune response. The key to the working of the immune system is the ability of one chemical to recognize to have a key in lock relationship with another. Thus, both the immune system and consciousness represent systems that learn, recognize, and remember. As I write this, I think of what Alfred North Whitehead said about understanding, that it is apperception of pattern as such. This is also a perfectly acceptable definition of consciousness. Awareness of pattern conveys the feeling that attends understanding. There presumably can be no limit to how much consciousness a species can acquire, since understanding is not a finite project with an imaginable conclusion, but rather a stance toward immediate experience. This appears self-evident from within a worldview that sees consciousness as analogous to a source of light. The more powerful the light, the greater the surface area of darkness revealed. Consciousness is the moment-to-moment -moment integration of the individual's perception of the world. How well, one could almost say how gracefully, an individual accomplishes this integration determines that individual's unique adaptive response to existence. We are masters not only of individual cognitive activity, but when acting together, of group cognitive activity as well. Cognitive activity within a group usually means the elaboration and manipulation of symbols and language. Although this occurs in many species, within the human species it is especially well developed. Our immense power to manipulate symbols and language gives us our unique position in the natural world. The power of our magic and our science arises out of our commitment to group mental activity, symbol sharing, meme replication, the spreading of ideas, and the telling of tall tales.
The idea that ordinary consciousness is the end product of a process of extensive compression and filtration, and that the psychedelic experience is the antithesis of this construction, was put forward by Aldous Huxley, who contrasted this with the psychedelic experience. In analyzing his experiences with mescaline, Huxley wrote, I find myself agreeing with the eminent Cambridge philosopher Dr. C.D. Broad that we should do well to consider the suggestion that the function of the brain and nervous system and sense organs is in the main eliminative and not productive. The function of the brain and nervous system is to protect us from being overwhelmed and confused by this mass of largely useless and irrelevant knowledge, by shutting out most of what we should otherwise perceive or remember at any moment, and leaving only that very small and special selection which is likely to be practically useful. According to such a theory, each one of us is potentially mind at large, but in so far as we are animals, our business is at all costs to survive. To make biological survival possible, mind at large has to be funneled through the reducing valve of the brain and nervous system. What comes out at the other end is a measly trickle of the kind of consciousness which will help us to stay alive on the surface of this particular planet. To formulate and express the contents of this reduced awareness, man has invented and endlessly elaborated those symbol systems and implicit philosophies which we call languages. Every individual is at once the beneficiary and the victim of the linguistic tradition into which he has been born. That which, in the language of religion, is called this world is the universe of reduced awareness, expressed, and as it were, petrified by language. The various other worlds with which human beings erratically make contact are so many elements in the totality of the awareness belonging to mind at large. Temporary bypasses may be acquired either spontaneously or as the result of deliberate spiritual exercises, or by means of drugs. What Huxley did not mention was that drugs, specifically the plant hallucinogens, can reliably and repeatedly open the floodgates of the reducing valve of consciousness, and expose the individual to the full force of the howling Tao. The way in which we internalize the impact of this experience of the unspeakable, whether encountered through psychedelics or other means, is to generalize and extrapolate our worldview through acts of imagination. These acts of imagination represent our adaptive response to information concerning the outside world that is conveyed to us by our senses. In our species, culture-specific, situation-specific, syntactic software in the form of language can compete with and sometimes replace the instinctual world of hardwired animal behavior. This means that we can learn and communicate experience and thus put maladaptive behaviors behind us. We can collectively recognize the virtues of peace over war or of cooperation over struggle. We can change. As we have seen, human language may have arisen when primate organizational potential was synergized by plant hallucinogens. The psychedelic experience inspired us to true self-reflective thought in the first place, and then further inspired us to communicate our thoughts about it. Others have sensed the importance of hallucinations as catalysts of human psychic organization. Julian Jaynes' theory presented in his controversial book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, makes the point that major shifts in human self-definition may have occurred even in historical times. He proposes that through Homeric times, people did not have the kind of interior psychic organization that we take for granted. Thus, what we call ego was, for Homeric people, a god. When danger threatened suddenly, the god's voice was heard in the individual's mind, an intrusive and alien psychic function was expressed as a kind of meta-program for survival called forth under moments of great stress. This psychic function was perceived by those experiencing it as the direct voice of a god, of the king, or of the king in the afterlife. Merchants and traders moving from one society to another brought the unwelcome news that the gods were saying different things in different places, and so cast early seeds of doubt. At some point, people integrated this previously autonomous function, and each person became the god and reinterpreted the inner voice as the self, or as it was later called, the ego. Jaynes's theory has been largely dismissed. Regrettably, his book on the impact of hallucinations on culture, though 467 pages in length, manages to avoid discussion of hallucinogenic plants or drugs nearly entirely. By this omission, Jaynes deprived himself of a mechanism that could reliably drive the kind of transformative changes he saw taking place in the evolution of human consciousness. Catalyzing Consciousness 
The impact of hallucinogens in the diet has been more than psychological. Hallucinogenic plants may have been the catalysts for everything about us that distinguishes us from other higher primates, for all the mental functions that we associate with humanness. Our society more than others will find this theory difficult to accept, because we have made pharmacologically obtained ecstasy a taboo. Like sexuality, altered states of consciousness are taboo because they are consciously or unconsciously sensed to be entwined with the mysteries of our origin, with where we came from and how we got to be the way we are. Such experiences dissolve boundaries and threaten the order of the reigning patriarchy and the domination of society by the unreflecting expression of ego. Yet consider how plant hallucinogens may have catalyzed the use of language, the most unique of human activities. One has, in a hallucinogenic state, the incontrovertible impression that language possesses an objectified and visible dimension, which is ordinarily hidden from our awareness. Language under such conditions is seen, is beheld, just as we would ordinarily see our homes and normal surroundings. In fact, our ordinary cultural environment is correctly recognized during the experience of the altered state as the base drone in the ongoing linguistic business of objectifying the imagination. In other words, the collectively designed cultural environment in which we all live is the objectification of our collective linguistic intent. Our language-forming ability may have become active through the mutagenic influence of hallucinogens working directly on organelles that are concerned with the processing and generation of signals. These neural substructures are found in various portions of the brain, such as Broca's area, that govern speech formation. In other words, opening the valve that limits consciousness forces utterance, almost as if the word is a concretion of meaning previously felt but left unarticulated. This active impulse to speak, the going forth of the word, is sensed and described in the cosmogonies of many peoples. Psilocybin specifically activates the area of the brain concerned with processing signals. A common occurrence with psilocybin intoxication is spontaneous outbursts of poetry and other vocal activity, such as speaking in tongues, though in a manner distinct from ordinary glossolalia. In cultures with a tradition of mushroom use, these phenomena have given rise to the notion of discourse with spirit doctors and supernatural allies. Researchers familiar with the territory agree that psilocybin has a profoundly catalytic effect on the linguistic impulse. Once activities involving syntactic self-expression were established habits among early human beings, the continued evolution of language in environments where mushrooms were scarce or unavailable permitted a tendency toward the expression and emergence of the ego. If the ego is not regularly and repeatedly dissolved in the unbounded hyperspace of the transcendent other, there will always be slow drift away from the sense of self as part of nature's larger whole. The ultimate consequence of this drift is the fatal ennui that now permeates Western civilization. The connection between mushrooms and language was brilliantly anticipated by Henry Munn in his essay, The Mushrooms of Language. Language is an ecstatic activity of signification. Intoxicated by the mushrooms, the fluency, the ease, the aptness of expression one becomes capable of are such that one is astounded by the words that issue forth from the contact of the intention of articulation with the matter of experience. The spontaneity the mushrooms liberate is not only perceptual but linguistic. For the shaman, it is as if existence were uttering itself through him. The Flesh Made Word the evolutionary advantages of the use of speech are both obvious and subtle. Many unusual factors converged at the birth of human language. Obviously, speech facilitates communication and cognitive activity, but it also may have had unanticipated effects on the whole human enterprise. Some neurophysiologists have hypothesized that the vocal vibration associated with human use of language caused a kind of cleansing of the cerebrospinal fluid. It has been observed that vibrations can precipitate and concentrate small molecules in the spinal fluid, which bathes and continuously purifies the brain. Our ancestors may have, consciously or unconsciously, discovered that vocal sound cleared the chemical cobwebs out of their heads. This practice may have affected the evolution of our present-day thin skull structure and proclivity for language. A self-regulated process as simple as singing might well have positive adaptive advantages if it also made the removal of chemical waste from the brain more efficient. The following excerpt supports this provocative idea. 
Vibrations of human skull, as produced by loud vocalization, exert a massaging effect on the brain and facilitate elution of metabolic products from the brain into the cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. The Neanderthals had a brain 15% larger than we have, yet they did not survive in competition with modern humans. Their brains were more polluted because their massive skulls did not vibrate and therefore the brains were not sufficiently cleaned. In the evolution of the modern humans, the thinning of cranial bones was important. As already discussed, hominids and hallucinogenic plants must have been in close association for a long span of time, especially if we want to suggest that actual physical changes in the human genome resulted from the association. The structure of the soft palate in the human infant and timing of its descent is a recent adaptation that facilitates the acquisition of language. No other primate exhibits this characteristic. This change may have been a result of selective pressure on mutations originally caused by the new omnivorous diet. Women and Language Women, the gatherers in the archaic hunter-gatherer equation, were under much greater pressure to develop language than were their male counterparts. Hunting, the prerogative of the larger male, placed a premium on strength, stealth, and stoic waiting. The hunter was able to function quite well on a very limited number of linguistic signals, as is still the case among hunting peoples of the Kung or the Maku. For gatherers, the situation was different. Those women with the largest repertoire of communicable images of foods and their sources and secrets of preparation were unquestionably placed in a position of advantage. Language may well have arisen as a mysterious power possessed largely by women, women who spent much more of their waking time together, and usually talking, than did men, women who in all societies are seen as group-minded in contrast to the lone male image, which is the romanticized version of the alpha male of the primate troop. The linguistic accomplishments of women are driven by a need to remember and describe to each other a variety of locations and landmarks, as well as numerous taxonomic and structural details about plants to be sought or avoided. The complex morphology of the natural world propelled by the evolution of language toward modeling of the world beheld. To this day a taxonomic description of a plant is a joycy and thrill to read. Shrub two to six feet in height, glabrous throughout. Leaves mostly opposite, some in threes or uppermost alternate, sessile, linear lanceolate or lanceolate, acute or acuminate. Flower solitary and axils, yellow with aroma, pedicillate. Calyx campanulate, petal soon caducus, obovate, and so on for many lines. The linguistic depth women attained as gatherers eventually led to a momentous discovery, the discovery of agriculture. I call it momentous because of its consequences. Women realized that they could simply grow a restricted number of plants. As a result, they learned the needs of only those few plants, embraced a sedentary lifestyle, and began to forget the rest of nature they had once known so well. At that point the retreat from the natural world began, and the dualism of humanity versus nature was born. As we will soon see, one of the places where the old goddess culture died, Katal Hayuk, in the present-day Anatolian Turkey, is the very place where agriculture may have first arisen. At places like Katalhayuk and Jericho, humans and their domesticated plants and animals became for the first time physically and psychologically separate from the life of untamed nature and the howling unknown. Use of hallucinogens can only be sanctioned in hunting and gathering societies. When agriculturists use these plants, they are unable to get up at dawn the morning after and go hoe the fields. At that point, corn and grain become gods, gods that symbolize domesticity and hard labor. These replace the old goddesses of plant-induced ecstasy. Agriculture brings with it the potential for overproduction, which leads to excess wealth, hoarding, and trade. Trade leads to cities. Cities isolate their inhabitants from the natural world. Paradoxically, more efficient utilization of plant resources through agriculture led to a breaking away from the symbiotic relationship that had bound human beings to nature. I do not mean this metaphorically. The ennui of modernity is the consequence of a disrupted quasi-symbiotic relationship between ourselves and Gaian nature. Only a restoration of this relationship in some form is capable of carrying us into a full appreciation of our birthright and sense of ourselves as complete human beings. Chapter 5. Habit as Culture and Religion At regular intervals that were probably lunar, the ordinary activities of the small nomadic group of herders were put aside. 
Rains usually followed the new moon in the tropics, making mushrooms plentiful. Gathering took place at night. Night is the time of magical projection and hallucinations, and visions are more easily obtained in darkness. The whole clan was present from oldest to youngest. Elders, especially shamans, usually women but often men, doled out each person's dose. Each clan member stood before the group and reflectively chewed and swallowed the body of the goddess before returning to his or her place in the circle. Bone flutes and drums wove within the chanting. Line dances with heavy foot stamping channeled the energy of the first wave of visions. Suddenly the elders signal silence. In the motionless darkness, each mind follows its own trail of sparks into the bush, while some people keen softly. They feel fear and they triumph over fear through the strength of the group. They feel relief mingled with wonder at the beauty of the visionary expanse. Some spontaneously reach out to those nearby in simple affection and an impulse for closeness or an erotic desire. An individual feels no distance between himself or herself and the rest of the clan or between the clan and the world. Identity is dissolved in the higher wordless truth of ecstasy. In that world, all divisions are overcome. There is only the one great life. It sees itself at play, and it is glad. The impact of plants on the evolution of culture and consciousness has not been widely explored, though a conservative form of this notion appears in R. Gordon Wasson's The Road to Eleusis. Wasson does not comment on the emergence of self-reflection in hominids, but does suggest hallucinogenic mushrooms as the causal agent in the appearance of spiritually aware human beings and the genesis of religion. Wasson feels that omnivorous foraging humans would have sooner or later encountered hallucinogenic mushrooms or other psychoactive plants in their environment. As man emerged from his brutish past thousands of years ago, there was a stage in the evolution of his awareness when the discovery of the mushroom, or was it a higher plant, with miraculous properties was a revelation to him, a veritable detonator to his soul, arousing in him sentiments of awe and reverence, and gentleness and love, to the highest pitch of which mankind is capable, all those sentiments and virtues that mankind has ever since regarded as the highest attribute of his kind. It made him see what this perishing mortal eye cannot see, how right the Greeks were to hedge about this mystery, this imbibing of the potion with secrecy and surveillance. Perhaps with all our modern knowledge we do not need the divine mushroom anymore. Or do we need them more than ever? Some are shocked that the key even to religion might be reduced to a mere drug. On the other hand, the drug is as mysterious as it ever was. Like the wind that comes we know not whence nor why. Out of a mere drug comes the ineffable, comes ecstasy. It is not the only instance in the history of humankind where the lowly has given birth to the divine. Scattered across the African grassland, the mushrooms would be especially noticeable to hungry eyes because of their inviting smell and unusual form and color. Once having experienced the state of consciousness induced by the mushrooms, foraging humans would return to them repeatedly in order to re-experience their bewitching novelty. This process would create what C. H. Waddington called a creode, a pathway of developmental activity, what we call a habit. Ecstasy We have already mentioned the importance of ecstasy for shamanism. Among early humans, a preference for the intoxication experience was ensured simply because the experience was ecstatic. Ecstatic is a word central to my argument and preeminently worthy of further attention. It is a notion that is forced on us whenever we wish to indicate an experience or a state of mind that is cosmic in scale. An ecstatic experience transcends duality. It is simultaneously terrifying, hilarious, awe-inspiring, familiar, and bizarre. It is an experience that one wishes to have over and over again. For a minded and language-using species like ourselves, the experience of ecstasy is not perceived as simple pleasure, but rather is incredibly intense and complex. It is tied up with the very nature of ourselves and our reality, our languages, and our imagings of ourselves. It is fitting, then, that it is enshrined at the center of shamanic approaches to existence. As Mirce Iliadi pointed out, shamanism and ecstasy are at root one concern. This shamanic complex is very old. It is found in whole or in part among the Australians, the archaic peoples of North and South America, in the polar regions, etc. 
The essential and defining element of shamanism is ecstasy. The shaman is a specialist in the sacred, able to abandon his body and undertake cosmic journeys in the spirit, in trance. Possession by spirits, although documented in a great many shamanisms, does not seem to have been a primary and essential element. Rather, it suggests a phenomenon of degeneration. For the supreme goal of the shaman is to abandon his body and rise to heaven or descend into hell, not to let himself be possessed by his assisting spirits, by demons or souls of the dead. The shaman's ideal is to master these spirits, not to let himself be occupied by them. Gordon Wasson added these observations on ecstasy. In his trance, the shaman goes on a far journey, the place of the departed ancestors or the netherworld or there where the gods dwell, and this wonderland is, I submit, precisely where the hallucinogens take us. They are a gateway to ecstasy. Ecstasy in itself is neither pleasant nor unpleasant. The bliss or panic into which it plunges you is incidental to ecstasy. When you are in a state of ecstasy, your very soul seems scooped out from your body and away it goes. Who controls its flight? Is it you or your subconscious or a higher power? Perhaps it is pitch dark, yet you see and hear more clearly than you have ever seen before. You are at last face to face with ultimate truth. This is the overwhelming impression or illusion that grips you. You may visit hell or the Elysian fields of Asphodel or the Gobi Desert or Arctic wastes. You know awe, you know bliss and fear, even terror. Everyone experiences ecstasy in his own way, and never twice in the same way. Ecstasy is the very essence of shamanism. The neophyte from the great world associates the mushrooms primarily with visions, but for those who know the Indian language of the shaman, the mushrooms speak through the shaman. The mushroom is the word. As Abla, as Aurelio told me, the mushroom bestows on the curandero what the Greeks call logos, the Aryan vac, Vedic kavya, poetic potency, as Louis Renault put it. The divine afflatus of poetry is the gift of the entheogen. The textual exegete, skilled only in dissecting the cruces of the verses lying before him, is of course indispensable, and his shrewd observations should have our full attention, but unless gifted with kavya, he does well to be cautious in discussing the higher reaches of poetry. He dissects the verses but knows not ecstasy, which is the soul of the verses. Shamanism as Social Catalyst In claiming that religion originated when hominids encountered hallucinogenic alkaloids, Wasson was at odds with Mirce Eliade. Eliade considered what he called narcotic shamanism to be decadent. He felt that if individuals cannot achieve ecstasy without drugs, then their culture is probably in a decadent phase. The use of the word narcotic, a term usually reserved for soporifics, to describe this form of shamanism betrays a botanical and pharmacological naivete. Wasson's view, which I share, is precisely the opposite. The presence of a hallucinogen indicates that shamanism is authentic and alive. The late, decadent phase of shamanism is characterized by elaborate rituals or deals and reliance on pathological personalities. Where these phenomena are central, shamanism is well on its way to becoming simply religion. And at its fullest, shamanism is not simply religion. It is a dynamic connection into the totality of life on the planet. If, as suggested earlier, hallucinogens operate in the natural environment as message-bearing molecules, exopheromones, then the relationship between primate and hallucinogenic plant signifies a transfer of information from one species to another. The benefits to the mushroom arise out of the hominid domestication of cattle, and hence the expansion of the niche occupied by the mushroom. Where plant hallucinogens do not occur, cultural innovation occurs very slowly, if at all. But we have seen that in the presence of hallucinogens, a culture is regularly introduced to ever more novel information, sensory input, and behavior, and thus is moved to higher and higher states of self-reflection. The shamans are the vanguard of this creative advance. How specifically might the consciousness-catalyzing properties of plants have played a role in the emergence of culture and religion? What was the effect of this folkway, this promotion of language-using, thinking but stoned hominids into the natural order? I believe that the natural psychedelic compounds acted as feminizing agents that tempered and civilized the egocentric values of the solitary hunter individual with the feminine concerns for child-rearing and group survival. 
the prolonged and repeated exposure to the psychedelic experience, the wholly other rupture of the mundane plane caused by the hallucinogenic ritual ecstasy, acted steadily to dissolve that portion of the psyche which we moderns call the ego. Wherever and whenever the ego function began to form, it was akin to a calcareous tumor or a blockage in the energy of the psyche. The use of psychedelic plants in a context of shamanic initiation dissolved, as it dissolves today, the knotted structure of the ego into undifferentiated feeling, what Eastern philosophy calls the Tao. This dissolving of individual identity into the Tao is the goal of much of Eastern thought and has traditionally been recognized as the key to psychological health and balance for both the group and the individual. To appraise our dilemma correctly, we need to appraise what this loss of Tao, this loss of collective connection to the earth, has meant for our humanness. Monotheism We in the West are the inheritors of a very different understanding of the world. Loss of connection to the Tao has meant that the psychological development of Western civilization has been markedly different from the East's. In the West, there has been a steady focus on the ego and on the god of the ego, the monotheistic ideal. Monotheism exhibits what is essentially a pathological personality pattern projected onto the ideal of God, the pattern of the paranoid, possessive, power-obsessed male ego. This god is not someone you would care to invite to a garden party. Also interesting is that the Western ideal is the only formulation of deity that has no relationship with woman at any point in the theological myth. In ancient Babylon, Anu was paired with his consort Manna. Grecian religion assigned Zeus a wife, many consorts, and daughters. These heavenly pairings are typical. Only the god of Western civilization has no mother, no sister, no female consort, and no daughter. Hinduism and Buddhism have maintained traditions of techniques of ecstasy that include, as stated in the yogic sutras of Patanjali, light-filled herbs, and the rituals of these great religions give ample scope for the expression and appreciation of the feminine. Sadly, the Western tradition has suffered a long, sustained break with the socio-symbiotic relationship to the feminine, and the mysteries of organic life that can be realized through shamanic use of hallucinogenic plants. Modern religion in the West is a set of social patterns, or a set of anxieties centered on a particular moral structure in view of obligation. Modern religion is rarely an experience of setting aside the ego. Since the 1960s, the spread of popular cults of transcendence, such as disco and reggae, is an inevitable and healthy counter to the generally moribund form religious expression has taken on in Western and high-tech culture. The connection between rock and roll and psychedelics is a shamanic connection. Trance, dance, and intoxication make up the archaic formula for both religious celebration and a guaranteed good time. The global triumph of Western values means we as a species have wandered into a state of prolonged neurosis because of the absence of a connection to the unconscious. Gaining access to the unconscious through plant hallucinogen use reaffirms our original bond to the living planet. Our estrangement from nature and the unconscious became entrenched roughly 2,000 years ago, during the shift from the age of the great god Pan to that of Pisces that occurred with the suppression of the pagan mysteries and the rise of Christianity. The psychological shift that ensued left European civilization staring into two millennia of religious mania and persecution, warfare, materialism, and rationalism. The monstrous forces of scientific industrialism and global politics that have been born into modern times were conceived at the time of the shattering of the symbiotic relationships with the plants that had bound us to nature from our dim beginnings. This left each human being frightened, guilt-burdened, and alone. Existential man was born. Terror of being was the placenta that accompanied the birth of Christianity, the ultimate cult of domination by the unconstrained male ego. The abandonment of the ego-dissolving rights of the visionary plants had allowed what began as an individually maladaptive style to become the guiding image of the entire social organism. From within the context of an unchecked growth of dominator values and history told from a dominator point of view, we need to turn attention back toward the archaic way of vision plants and the goddess. Pathological Monotheism 
The drive for unitary wholeness within the psyche, which is to a degree instinctual, can nevertheless become pathological if pursued in a context in which dissolution of boundaries and rediscovery of the ground of being has been made impossible. Monotheism became the carrier of the dominator model, the Apollonian model of the self as solar and complete in its masculine expression. As a result of this pathological model, the worth and power of emotion in the natural world have been devalued and replaced by a narcissistic fascination with the abstract and the metaphysical. This attitude has proved a double-edged sword. It has given science explanatory power and its capacity for moral bankruptcy. Dominator culture has shown a remarkable ability to redesign itself to meet changing levels of technology and collective self-awareness. In all its manifestations, monotheism has been, and remains, the single most stubborn force resisting perception of the primacy of the natural world. Monotheism strenuously denies the need to return to a cultural style that periodically places the ego and its values in perspective through contact with a boundary-dissolving immersion in the archaic mystery of plant-induced, hence mother-associated, psychedelic ecstasy and wholeness, what Joyce called the Mama Matrix Most Mysterious. Archaic Sexuality This is not to imply that the life of the nomadic pastoralist is free of anxiety. Doubtless jealousy and possessiveness persisted among mushroom-using archaic humans, if only as a vestige of hierarchical organization in the social forms of proto-hominids. Observation of modern primates, of their dominance games and their violently enforced hierarchical structure, suggests that proto-hominid societies that were pre-mushroom may well have been dominator in style. Thus we may have experienced no more than a brief abandonment of the dominator style a brief tendency toward a true dynamic and conscious equilibrium with nature, at variance with our primate past and too soon crushed beneath the chariot wheels of historical process. Since the abandonment of our sojourn with mushroom use in the African Eden, we have only become progressively more bestial in our treatment of one another. An open and non-proprietary approach to sexuality is fundamental to the partnership model, but this tendency was synergized and strengthened by the orgiastic behavior that was certainly a part of the African goddess mushroom religion. Group sexual activity within a small tribe of hunter-gatherers and group experiences with hallucinogens acted to dissolve boundaries and differences between people and to promote the open and unstructured sexuality that is naturally a part of nomadic tribalism. This is not to imply that contemporary mushroom rituals are orgies, despite what a small, sensation-hungry segment of the public may choose to believe. Ibogaine Among the Fang The Bwiti cults of West Africa, discussed in Chapter 3, offer an instructive example. Use of a hallucinogenic indole-containing plant provides not only visionary ecstasy, but also what its users call open-heartedness. This quality, a caring awareness of others, is widely believed to explain the internal cohesiveness of Fang society and the ability of Buddhists among the Fang to resist commercial and missionary incursions into their cultural integrity. Neither Buddhists nor Fang felt they could eradicate ritual sin or evil in the world. This incapacity means that men have to celebrate. Good and bad walk together. As Fang frequently enough told missionaries, we have two hearts, good and bad. Early missionaries, aware of these self-confessed contradictions, evangelized with the promise of one-heartedness in Christianity. But Fang by and large did not find it there. For many, Christian one-heartedness was a constriction of their selves. While one-heartedness is celebrated in Buidi, it is a one-heartedness which is coagulated out of a flow of many qualities from one state to another. It is goodness achieved in the presence of badness, and aboveness achieved in the presence of belowness, it is an emergent quality energized in the presence of its opposite. Paradoxically, ibogaine, the indole hallucinogen responsible for the pharmacological activity of the weedy plant, Tabernanthia boga, is widely recognized both as a factor holding married couples together in the face of fang institutions like easy divorce and as an aphrodisiac. It is perhaps one of the few plants of the many dozens claimed to be aphrodisiacs that actually performs as advertised. Most other candidates for the title are in fact mere stimulants that can cause a generalized arousal and sustained erection. Ibogaine seems actually to change, to deepen, and to enhance the psychological mechanisms that lie behind sexual drive. 
one experiences a simultaneous sense of detachment and involvement that is empowering. Yet in situations where sexual activity is neither sanctioned nor appropriate, ibogaine does not cause or even raise the possibility of sexual behavior. In these situations, it functions much as ayahuasca functions among its traditional users, as a boundary-dissolving visionary hallucinogen. Here is another example of research only waiting for social attitudes to change in order to be done. If the impact of ibogaine on sexual dysfunction is found to be congruent with its folklore, then further research might be especially promising. These powerful plants that change our relationship to our sexuality and our view of self and world are the special province of peoples whom we are accustomed to thinking of as primitive. This is but one more indication of the extent to which unconsciously imbibed dominator attitudes have robbed us of participation in the wider and richer world of Eros and the spirit. For easily discerned reasons, the dominator societies that arose to replace partnership societies were far less eager to suppress group sexual activities than they were to suppress the hallucinogenic mushroom religion. Group sexual activity without the dissolution of the dominator ego would help the most ego-obsessed males gain power and rise in the social hierarchy. Since domination of others ultimately includes sexual domination as well, this would explain the persistence of orgies and group sexual activities in many of the mystery religions, at the festivals of Dionysus and the Roman Saturnalia, and within paganism generally long after the heart of the pagan world had ceased to beat. Eventually, however, the dominator anxiety about the establishing of clear lines of male paternity outweighed all other considerations. Then ego domination finally achieved complete preeminence. Through Christianity's ruthless extermination of all heterodoxy, orgies were recognized and suppressed as the subversive, boundary-dissolving activities that they are. Contrasts in Sexual Politics Several important contrasts emerge from a comparison of the ego-based dominator society and the non-rigid, psychologically unbounded partnership society. Much diminished in the partnership model is the proprietary attitude of men toward women that is so centrally a part of the dominator model. Less prominent as well is the tendency for women to seek extended commitment to pair bonding from men in the pursuit of security and vicarious social ranking. Family organization is not rigid and hierarchical. Children are raised by an extended family of cousins and siblings, aunts and uncles, and former and current sexual partners of their parents. In such a milieu, a child has many different relationships and a variety of role models. Group values are not usually at odds with that of the individual or his or her mate and children. Adolescent sexual experimentation is expected and encouraged. Couples may bond for any number of reasons related to themselves and the welfare of the group. Such bonding may be, but is not necessarily, lifelong. Sexuality is rarely taboo in such societies, only becoming so as a result of contact with dominator values. In dominator society, men tend to choose sexual partners who are young, healthy, and capable of bearing many children. And the strategy of women within a dominator society is often to bond with an older man who, by being in control of group resources, food, land, or other women, could ensure that a woman's worth won't be devalued as she becomes older and passes out of her childbearing years. In the ideal partnership society, older men may have sexual relations with younger women, but without threatening the bonds that have been formed with older women. However, women are not driven to seek reproductive security under the protection of older men. This situation arose because power did not lie exclusively with aging and powerful males. Rather, power was distributed between men and women and through all age groups. Ultimate power in such societies was the power to create and sustain life, and so was naturally imaged as female, the power of the great goddess. Jean Baker Miller pointed out that the so-called need to control and dominate others is psychologically a function, not a feeling of power, but of a feeling of powerlessness. Distinguishing between power for oneself and power over others, she writes, in a basic sense, the greater the development of each individual, the more able, more effective, and less needy of limiting or restricting others she or he will be. Partnership societies do not simply replace a patriarchy with a matriarchy. Such concepts are too limited and gender-bound. The real difference here is between a society based on partnership and roles appropriate to age, size, and level of skill, 
and a society in which a dominance hierarchy is maintained at the expense of the full expression and social utilization of the individuals within the group. In the partnership situation, the lack of concepts based on property and ego inflation made jealousy and possessiveness less of a problem. The generally hostile attitude of dominator society toward sexual expression can be traced to the terror that the dominator ego feels in any situation in which boundaries are dissolved, even the most pleasurable and natural of situations. The French notion of orgasm as petit mort perfectly encapsulates the fear and fascination that boundary-dissolving orgasm holds for dominator cultures.